in the end, it has this awful parallel with fascism, so to speak. If they don't agree, then they seek to take you down, not with argument, but with um, marginalization. To get Brexit. Make America great again. No, no, no. This is Stephen Edgington for The Sun, and today I'm interviewing Winston Peters. Winston Peters is the Deputy Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister of New Zealand. He stands for the New Zealand First Party. We're going to be talking about the upcoming election in New Zealand, the woke movement, and New Zealand's relationship with China. Thank you so much, Winston Peters, for joining us. Uh, no, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> I trust things are well with you in the UK. My first question is about China. You are obviously the Foreign Minister for New Zealand. Is there currently a new Cold War between China and the West? I don't know whether you'd call it a Cold War, but it's dramatically a changed circumstance from in the case of uh, Hong Kong in 1997 uh, when the handover happened and the one country, two systems commitment was made by China. There's a long, a long uh, series of changes that have resulted to where we are now, rather sad to say. Is Hong Kong now lost to the Chinese Communist Party? Well, the uh, so-called security laws passed by Beijing have dramatically changed the events in uh, Hong Kong and the circumstances. The one country, two systems, the right to democracy, the right to freedoms and the right to rule of law are all under challenge now. And just of the last few days, certain candidates have been told, you cannot stand in the next upcoming elections in Hong Kong. So we have to have our eyes wide open right around the world when we look at the circumstance and admit that unless there is a return to the commitment of 1997, that it may be the case that uh, Hong Kong, we know, is lost. It's pretty hard to make the argument that it's a, it's a democracy anymore. Do you, would you agree with that statement? Well, if you're not going to have a democracy with fair availability for entrance, no matter what their political philosophy is to contest the election, if you're going to have all sorts of uh, precursory statements that you cannot be a candidate unless you fit these criteria laid out by us, and not in Hong Kong, but dare I say it in Beijing, then it's not a democracy as we know it. Now, obviously, uh, New Zealand has recently dropped the extradition treaty with China. Why did you do that? Well, we have uh, in our country, and uh, we've been a democracy, a democracy since. 1854, with an unbroken line of holding elections every three years. We, we haven't had a three-year term or the curse of a three-year term, not five years like the UK. But every three years, since 1854, we believe in the rule of law and we believe in fundamental principles of human rights, which we are signed up to, joined with many countries internationally in the, in the defence of these rights. And we could see that the extradition treaty that we had would no longer in any way be uh, the, the treaty we originally signed. In fact, we couldn't go on trying to enforce it or honour it, so we withdrew. Let's talk about some of the human rights abuses going on in China this very day. Um, recently, we've seen, I don't know if you saw the interview with the Chinese ambassador in the UK, where he was shown a video on the BBC uh, of Uyghur Muslims being transported into trains, their heads were shaved, they looked like prisoners. Um, there are estimates that up to 3 million Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, in that region of China, are unfortunately in concentration camps over there. There's reports of forced sterilization, of torture, and of various human rights abuses. This is unacceptable, isn't it? And if, it's, if it is in, in your eyes and in New Zealand's eyes, what are you doing to try and prevent China from committing some of the worst human rights abuses imaginable? Well, first of all, we have raised it with China when we've had our dialogue with them. We know full well that around Asia, there are countries looking seriously hard at what's happening there. Probably no less a concerned country would be Indonesia, the biggest Muslim country in the world, a modern uh, and moderate democracy is emerging in Indonesia. So there's a lot of countries, there are a lot of countries looking at that really hard. We've done what we can do beyond saying we disagree with what we see as emerging there and asking for answers. There's not much a country the size of South Carolina and population of 5 million people can do. 
but make a stand as to what we will not accept, whether it's Tibet or, for example, the Uyghurs in West China, has been a position we've taken for some considerable time. And obviously, it's a really difficult decision for countries like New Zealand and even the UK to make when we're so reliant on China. Um, I believe New, New Zealand's exports, obviously, there's a big reliance on there with, with China. It's a huge economy. It's an emerging economy. Some people are calling it a superpower. How do you decide that balance where, you know, we've got these, these things going on in China? We've mentioned the Uyghur Muslim population. We've mentioned um, the national security law in Hong Kong. How do you balance the interests of New Zealanders who rely, their companies, their businesses may rely on China and the things that I've just mentioned there? Yeah, I'll just make it clear on Tibet that we have always uh, um, argued for our right to see the Dalai Lama. If he wants to see anybody in New Zealand, he's got the right to come to our country. He's had the right to conduct a dialogue just in case someone mistakes what, uh, mistakenly reports what I've said. On the question of China's economy, it's not an emerging economy. It's long since cut past an emerging economy. It may have the convenience to argue that for areas like tariffs and other things that they have enforced and other against other countries. But bear this in mind, China is a country of 1.4 billion people, and there are 2 billion in the Communist Party in control of the country's total destiny. They are acutely aware of the need for provisioning of food in a rising economy, benefiting every Chinese person. They're as aware as you and I are a democracy. So it's a two-way street. Yes, we are, have a dependence on China in terms of our exports, but China has a huge dependence on imports as well. And people forget that. They don't see it with balance. And China is a nation that too many Western politicians have thought they could read without doing the history, without being ultra cautious of how long term they are. When you go and see a Chinese artwork, a magnificent artwork that took a family 250 years to create for the emperor, only then you, do you understand the mind that you're dealing with. And as you know, in our country, and dare I say it, yours, there's a, the kind of view that was best articulated by Queen and Freddie Mercury. I want it all and I want it now. And you cannot compete against a country like China if you've got that view. And so I would say to Western politicians, and I've said to my colleagues, be far more aware of what and who you're dealing with. Respect the longevity of that country. And we may, you may, if you do understand that, be able to get better results in your negotiations. But I hear and see a huge misreading of what's happening as to the rest of the world's contemplation of China. And I do not think that the uh, inevitable trends that some forecasters have put out there are in fact going to be a fact. The world is changing dramatically and China has to respond as well. Now, Mr. Peters, you are well known for answering direct questions, for speaking your mind on various issues. And I want to ask you this question. Ronald Reagan famously described the Soviet Union as an evil empire. Now, we've talked again about some of the issues that China has been going through in the last five years, but also in its, throughout its whole history. We've seen Chairman Mao the, uh, under Chairman Mao's regime, tens of millions of people starved to death under his policies. And Tiananmen Square in 1989, thousands of students being shot. And obviously more recent issues with Uyghur Muslims in Tibet and on Hong Kong. Is China the new evil empire? Well, before you shade past that, I'm glad you raised Ronald Reagan, because he was right. And of course, Gorbachev was the person that took them out of that in the early 90s to bring what they are now, accepting I don't know whether you've read a speech that was made by, of all people, uh, Nixon, about the need when China came out of uh, the communist uh, yoke, so to speak, for the West to understand how they could help them be a far better democracy. The West didn't, of course, and we end up with what we've got now in China. It's an area of, no area of enormous caution that uh, people see not just the next year, the year after the decades from now, they've got to see what the trend might look like. Now come to China. There's no doubt when the new president took over, uh, he said his country's number one problem was corruption. And many of us were encouraged by that uh, because it showed an, an enlightenment going forward. But then of course he made himself president for life. 
and then things have changed so that the previous circumstance where one could share information knowing that they understood the problem of taking, for example, 160 million people out of state services into sort of industry, all the difficulties they had. The China that we're talking about in the last few years is dramatically changed. And I don't know whether enough commentators understand that. Uh, I'm not going to give an image or depict it in the way that you have. All I'm saying is that we need all of us in the Western world to be more acutely aware of what we're dealing with. If it's not an evil empire, what is it? I mean, if people would like to characterise regimes around the world. I mean, I think we live in Western democracies over in New Zealand and, and in Britain. How would you describe China as a power? Well, it's a seriously emerging power. It's a country that has contested the Spratly Islands with a number of countries, including Vietnam, all the way down to the uh, Philippines. A whole lot of countries are contesting their rights there. You've got the law of the sea. You've got international conventions and decisions which they are not prepared to respect. Uh, and that's why this uh, growing tension is arising. Um, in many areas, uh, for example, I don't know whether you realize they started with one belt, one road, that's Obor. And that wasn't going too well. Then they switched to two belts and roads and pushed that idea around the world. And that also, I don't think it's going so well, uh, even though it's a huge drive internationally for respect and for connectivity. But a lot of countries, when they see what's happening with the Uyghurs, when they see what's happening with the Spratly Islands, they may not say much, but it doesn't mean that they haven't got their own internal thoughts or privately they're sharing amongst them, the power structure of those countries, serious concerns. Now, uh, it's like in Chairman Mao's book, and I don't think enough people have read it, but he said, push forward. If you strike much, push forward again. If you strike steel, pull back. That's what the West has got to be certain in terms of principles, democracy, the rule of law that we uphold. Recent reports say that uh, the Five Eyes nations, that is the five nations, in, you know, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the United States, um, who share intelligence between each other, are considering letting Japan into the club to counterbalance China's influence in the region. Is that going to happen? <laughs> What sort of five eyes nation would you think we are if I was to answer that question, even if you're right or wrong? I mean, it would not be a pro Would you support it? I'll, 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 uh, I'll rearrange the question. Would you support Japan coming in? Well, we have always supported other countries who share our values being part and parcel of the Ford Growing Program. And that's why we have been excited in this part of the world with the rising moderation of the, India, uh, of the Indonesian government. You've got the biggest Islamic country in the world, but now reaching out to expand their economy and to uh, expand their uh, connectivity with other countries like Australia and like New Zealand in a way that they've never had before. These are encouraging signs. The world's not all going, the world's not going to hell in the handbasket, so you just speak in the way some people might say. And so when we say share information with Japan, well, we've never had such enhanced relations with Japan, Japan as we have now. We put a lot of work into it because, again, Japan is a great economy, one of the greatest economies in the world. And uh, they are concerned about their environment and their surroundings as much as we are. So the Indo-Pacific concept that we are pushing very hard for going as a plan to go forward with shared values and shared uh, commitments is growing. And uh, all that gives us confidence that some of the concerns we might have is not as, are not as sort of a, impossible as some of the com commentators might say so. Let's talk about the coronavirus crisis briefly. New Zealand's response to the coronavirus crisis has been praised around the world. Um, you have very few cases, very few deaths. Uh, you lock down very early, not allowing people into the country. However, there are some genuine concerns from many New Zealanders who are worried about the impact of the lockdowns on one of New Zealand's largest industries, and that is tourism. Are you worried about the impact? Have you gone too far with these coronavirus lockdowns? Are you worried the economy just can't handle these measures? Well, you raised some very serious questions there. Look, we watched uh, as Taiwan uh, did very, very well. Taiwan's got 22 million people, 24 million, I think 22, 24 million people. 
they've got an incredible record, but they saw earlier than we did and reflected on the SARS outbreak. And so they went into um, remediation and a fight back as fast as they possibly could. It was incredible. Here's the point here. In uh, the case of New Zealand, the information didn't come to us as fast as we could. And at the time, you recall, the WHO at that time was not calling it a pandemic. A lot of countries got blindsided by the failure to understand just what we're dealing with. But when we did, we went into lockdown real fast. And as a consequence, uh, tourism became a serious victim to it. We can't change that. Because right now, next door to us in Australia and Melbourne, the whole thing is exploding out. And it's gotten to, back into New South Wales. So, the, and the cases are rising. And we don't want that. We've got to stick to keeping things safe. I suppose the argument that some might make, you know, small business people in New Zealand, is that it may be a long time until we get a vaccine. It may be a very long time until, um, if ever that is, um, until we can deal with this pandemic. And surely at some point, we're going to have to reopen our economies. We're going to start having to relive our lives because we can't go on like this forever. What do you make of that argument that, you know, inevitably we're going to have to one day unlock? Well, it sounds like a reasonable argument or view until it looks like what's happening in Melbourne right now or what's happening in the United States or dare I say it's Spain or dare I say it's sadly in the UK. It looks like you've got a whole lot of people whose everyday lives are going to be imperiled on a constant basis by a mobile walking disease, the shape and face and character of which they don't know. And you can make all those arguments out. But in the end, we've lost huge tourism. That's a fact. But what we can do and have to do is reshape our economy and add far greater value to things we have got and have far more internal tourism to begin with. New Zealand is one of the greatest nations of travel there ever has been. We're very outward looking. We used to read more foreign magazines than any other nation per capita. That's how sort of extrovert we are and looking offshore. But touring now and tourism is going to have to be internal. I don't want to be obstructive about this, but we cannot see any way through it unless you're prepared to contemplate saying, well, we're going to have to have a whole lot of people dying and that's the way it is some sort of Darwinian uh, scheme by which we survive and the survival of the fittest happens. And we know it'll be the old people. You know, they might be suggesting, well, why don't we lock all the old people away then? Just imagine how discordant that would be and how impossible it would be because people want to see their parents and grandparents. So the answer is, yes, you can make those statements out. But tell us what it means downstream and look at the world and, and, and uh, the case of the US and Spain other countries where it's blowing out in huge proportion and the deaths are massive and tell me that's what you want for this country. I don't think they're right. It's interesting you mentioned the WHO earlier and I want to talk briefly again about the origins of the coronavirus. Many people criticised, including the US President Donald Trump, the WHO for being too close to China, for being too slow to act, for allowing China um, not to be transparent with the virus early on and for supporting China who you know, as I said, weren't transparent, were too slow to give um, information about the virus, would shut down whistleblowing doctors uh, in December last year. Perhaps it's time to follow the US and for New Zealand to leave the WHO. What do you make of that argument? Well, we said uh, from um, our country that the WHO missed the timing of this, missed the signals, and for whatever reasons, there had to be a full-scale inquiry internationally, including China, of the origins of COVID-19. And we said it would be in China's interest. And I made that statement very, very clear. Not popular with some countries, not popular with China when I said it, but we stuck to it on the basis that I could not conceive of any country wishing to see the lessons learned from this go take uh, the, be, be embedded in the, in the world after it and not be part of the process. Anyway, in the end, China went to the WHO, you, uh, to the World Health Assembly, you recall, and it was signed off unanimously to be a full-scale inquiry, including China. But that should have been something that was contemplated by China in the first place, given that two and a half million people went through Wuhan and kept on going around the world. That's why it was in Europe and elsewhere. It's not rocket science to work that out. China has obviously pushed back against many of the actions um, of what they 
would see as hostile states or, or hostile actions from Western countries, whether that's uh, the USA closing down a consulate, China retaliated, whether it's the UK um, ending Huawei's involvement in our 5G infrastructure, China wasn't happy about that. And obviously New Zealand has been at the forefront in many people's eyes of standing up to China and holding China to account. And China really didn't take that very well, as, as I'm sure you've experienced. I've seen the ambassadorial comment out of uh, your country where China is concerned, and dare I say, Australia, and we've had a variety of that in my country, but we have said, uh, look, with respect, we have talked to you and had commitments. We believe that you will keep your commitments and will go on believing it whilst you keep them. I mean, it's not a circuitous argument, it's a straight statement. We trust you to keep your word. Uh, and uh, to uh, you know, have the megaphone diplomacy that some of the ambassadors are involved in, in is not at all helpful. Not when the evidence points truly to the fact that it started in Wuhan. And had we got earlier notice, perhaps we could have taken far greater remedial measures all around the world uh, to contain this malignancy. But we didn't. And we should have got that notice. As I say, Taiwan better understood what they were looking at. They got off earlier and their record is probably the best in the world. I want to ask about your personal experience with any pushback that you've received from China. I'll, pre I'll pretext that with um, some statements. So China, for example, has put sanctions on US senators who have been critical of China. The UK government and the US and the Canadian government has said that China have been trying to hack into vaccine research in all of those countries. And China is known to target particular politicians who they think aren't necessarily China's best friends. So have you experienced any of this kind of pushback personally as a politician? Have you had any phishing attempts on your emails or anything like that um, from China? Well, not to the best of my knowledge. And uh, I wouldn't expect it given that I head a very, very competent department and um, I'm in the security uh, upper echelons committee of the, the cabinet. In fact, I chair it. So uh, I wouldn't expect that, no. Let's talk about the rise of the woke movement. Now, you've been in politics for a long time, a long, long time. Um, and we've seen over recent years the rise of political correctness, as some people would call it, the rise of what, what, what some call cancel culture, where if you say the wrong opinions, you're going to be fired from your job, where people are very afraid to speak out on certain issues, where universities <coughs> have, in, again, some people's eyes been taken over by left-wing academics. What do you make of this rise of what people call the woke movement? Well, it's very concerning. I was at a Victoria, that's Auckland, uh, sorry, Wellington University lecture the other day, just this week, and um, talking to them about this and saying, I know you've got your views. You're all young. You're all exploding into the great awareness world of young people. When you come to university, you come to the eyes, blink it, and all of a sudden, it's massive expansion of the, your personal trajectory of views and ideas. But what you're saying when you behave that way is that my mother and my father and my grandmother and grandfather had no values worth respecting at all. Or the people that first came to this country had nothing to contribute at all. Whether it be European or Maori, in my case in New Zealand, nothing to contribute at all. I saw this uh, doctor in Australia attacking Captain Cook, of all people, uh, for, uh, for example, she said, bring this uh, scourge of uh, colonialism with him and all the full um, uh, montage of the things that she hated. Now, what was astonishing about that is that before Botany Bay ever began, the first settlement of Australia ever began, began by Europeans out of the UK, Captain Cook was dead. And so when you don't understand history and you, you launch attacks like that, you open yourself up to be described as an ignoramus, and worse than that, an arrogant one as well. And so my view is that when these people say that my concern, my values are more important than yours, and I'm going to tear down that statue, change the statute books, or, for example, in the case of one party in New Zealand, change the name of the country uh, from um, New Zealand to Aotearoa, which is not the Maori name for New Zealand, by the way, uh, then you realise what you're up against. But it's like rust some, in some ways. They never sleep. 
and they're in certain echelons of the influence, and you've got to be on red alert, eyes wide open, to uh, to ensure that they, they do not succeed, because in the end, it has this awful parallel with fascism, so to speak. If they don't agree, then they seek to take you down, not with argument, but with um, marginalization, and dare I say it, cinderella cinderella of your views and your personality. Has any of this woke rust rubbed off on Jacinda Ardern, do you think? No, I wouldn't say that <laughs> in that context. He's uh, very genuine, very, very uh, intelligent person and uh, someone who doesn't know how to seriously analyse uh, policy uh, and is also not immune to, to listening to others sharing their views. I mean, when she became the Prime Minister, you could have said we were taking a serious risk with someone who had no experience in government. But we did, well, in my case, think I, I knew what I was dealing with and that someone who could do, uh, if given the chance, and with a lot of experience around her, a seriously good job. And I think COVID has proved dramatically what a fine leadership job she has done. So uh, it's not that, that level I'm hearing, and I'm seeing in all other areas of society when pockets of correctness, so to speak, and it's unbelievable it just how ridiculous and how indefensible it is when it's given the sunlight of examination. It's interesting because, as I mentioned earlier, you're, you're known for speaking your mind, you're known for ignoring political correctness, and you've done that for a very long time. Do you think that this woke movement has made a lot of people feel unable to speak out on certain issues, unable to um, speak their mind? And what would, you, what would be your advice to people who, maybe you're going to university and all of your lecturers and friends say, oh no, you can't, for example, not support the Black Lives Matter movement. What would be your advice to people who are a bit worried about speaking out and speaking their mind? Well, my advice is if you do uh, not stand up against that, then the very uh, foundations of freedom and liberty will be imperiled. It is sinister how this can take hold and so wrong, but it actually marginalizes people it categorizes first and marginalizes people in the very same way that they say that the system is done to them. Now, the system over the years has not been perfect. And a lot of the improvements in the system have been to ensure that everyone has a place and everyone has a respect. But what I'm seeing, take the Black Lives Matter. George uh, Floyd, uh, his brother said, and he made it very clear, that none of these protests were helping his family at all. They were just abusing the family's name and loss and tragedy for their own purposes. And it was pretty left wing and it was pretty radical. In fact, so radical, it verged on, you know, what you might call a new type of leftist fascism, so to speak. I watched it very, very carefully. I saw it happening in my country with people running, rushing out. And of course, the answer to that is, ah, yes. Well, how long do you think they're going to stay on this movement? I saw it in growing up when the American civil rights movement was in full flight. And then the Vietnam War turned up and they just left the civil rights movement, the black civil rights movement, and went straight to the Vietnam protests and the poor African-Americans were lost. Now, again, this is not something they're concerned about in terms of uh, the George Floyd just tragedy and murder. No, it's what they want to make of it. And some of us are not fooled. And that's why I've said, of course, lives matter. Every life matters. That's the fact of it. That's what a modern society believes in. But what we can't stand, and I happen to be uh, somebody whose background goes back a thousand years in my country, what we can't stand is tokenism and paternalism where you pigeonhole us as to where we should be. We happen to believe that people should be free, to choose to be equal, because they've been skilled and trained to make that choice. That's where we differ from these people. They think that they can bestow it by way of their beneficence, usually from the taxpayer, and that never works. We know that the escalators to equality are proper laws and proper educational outcomes. That's where we differ from them. How far is this? these ideas, how far have they got in New Zealand? Well, there's a huge, uh, quite a huge kickback because you should never underestimate the silent majority. I saw it in the Brexit campaign where all those people 
had never been on the electoral rolls, had never voted, but they were coming out quietly under the radar, registering for the first time. And uh, as someone who predicted months before that the British were leaving, gave my reasons. I saw it in the, in the case of the uh, campaign at the last presidential election. Doesn't matter whether you liked or disliked Donald Trump. The fact of the matter is that when you learn of people who hadn't enrolled or voted or done anything in politics for 35 years going out to roll, you're hearing of the silent majority coming out. And from so far back, he won. What was the unwinnable election or the unlosable one for Hillary Clinton? But it shows you how far the pulses were out of touch and the so-called experts were out of touch. And dare I say it, the media and commentary utterly out of touch. Then in Australia just last year, there was an election. The Labour Party lost the unlosable election there because, again, the pulses and the media simply got it wrong. The world has changed and the silent majority of forgotten people should never be underestimated, particularly when it comes to elections. I do want to talk about Brexit and let, let's get on to that in a minute. But first of all, let's focus in on that silent majority that you talk about. I was reading an article and also the media. I was reading an article in The Guardian recently about your election hopes and the upcoming uh, New Zealand elections. And they basically implied that this could be the end of the road for New Zealand first. They said, are we, are we witnessing the last bows of a proud party? You're currently at around 2% in the polls. Many people have written you off before Winston Peters. I'm not going to do that now in this interview. But what do you make of this argument that this is the last chance, this is the last bows of New Zealand first? Well, we've been the uh, victims of a vicious campaign run by certain sections in the media for their own reasons. But let me tell you, uh, they've been writing me off for decades and we're still standing because they haven't been wrong and they don't understand the New Zealand people. I'm confident of where we're going to be on election night and I'm confident of where we are now. And it most certainly is not on 2%. And here's the point. Every one of these people, and they are cowards, ends their article with the statement, but you can never write Winston Peters off. So just in case my vicious attack on him doesn't work, I'm going to put that in there to show that I don't have to fly a white flag on election night or be called to, to account. But our job is to turn these so-called polls to confetti. And here's the point. We've had two polls recently where the gap between the two polls is beyond 14%. Now, there's no respectable country in the world or democracy in the world where if they go beyond 2 and a half, three percent 3% between the pulses, they don't get together and try and correct the methodology. But not here. And so we're going to pay those polls, never know mine, and get on with the job and make sure we're there on election night. Um, let me say... Here's the, the amusing thing about this. I'm going from this program to one of the biggest programs in New Zealand in the morning on the weekend. And they're not asking me on because they think I'm going to lose. Because if they were, why would they bother having me in the first place? And, you know, I don't want to press this other than to say, uh, like any great cause, the outcome is largely down to your own management of the pathway to that outcome. And we are a party, of course, that has a significant voting base that is not online in terms of being on the phones, not online in other areas uh, in the way that uh, the ordinary voter is, because we have a lot of old people who vote for us, uh, people over 65 years of age. But then they vote, they vote in one mass. Nobody's polling them. Or just one thing. When you have a poll and 25% won't declare, it's not a poll, is it? That's where elections are won, in the undeclared 25%. If you're so confident with these, uh, you know, with the election coming up, why aren't you standing to be an MP yourself? Well, look, I've got a huge... Uh, our country is the same size as the UK. Uh, we've got to get around up and down the whole country. And I have been an MP for a long time. In fact, uh, very few MPs can say they've been an MP in three constituencies. Different ones, not boundary changes, but three different ones. I think I might be the only person who can say that, apart from if you go back to George Gray, which is a long way back in the last uh, two centuries ago. Now, well, I'm not standing because I've got to cover the country and uh, I've got candidates everywhere else, but we in, under MMP do not have to do that. And you've got to remember Helmut Kohl 
was 16 years the leader of Germany in the same situation. Now, I'm not Helmut Kohl, but there are parallels. Jacinda Ardern has rocket high poll numbers. I mean, some people are saying even 60%. This is almost unheard of in uh, Western democracies. What's she doing so right? And, and also, how would you rate her? I mean, uh, let's say out of 10 out of 10, how, how's she done as prime minister? Well, on the big issue, and that's what it is, which is COVID-19, uh, she's done a tremendous job and kept her eye with some key medical people right on the ball, so to speak. And of course, we have, despite all those things, the what we call the tyranny of distance has now become the liberty of distance because we're cut off as an island nation a long way from other countries, and that's been uh, a lucky circumstance for us. But keeping your eyes on the prize and staying on focus and getting these illness, uh, an army of five million people to stick to the plan has been the reason why she is so popular. But, you know, uh, how shall I say it? The economy is what the, the selection will be largely about as well. Maybe not as, as much so in the past, but it'll still be about what the selection's about. And then some of these other polls have been, in my view, uh, well, this, this plain erroneous. Things will close, close up, and they're closing up as we speak. But you can't deny, as Ronald Reagan said, you can't argue with success. Why do you think that kind of magic dust from the, the, the success that she has um, with the coronavirus crisis hasn't quite rubbed off on you? Or maybe you think it has. <laughs> because we have, uh, we've got on with the job of keeping the show going alongside the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister's fronted every day. Uh, look, Indonesia moved 132,000 people back to Indonesia, which they regard as a major uh, achievement. But my department, that's Foreign Affairs, uh, helped and facilitated and got plane organizations and bookings organized for 80,000 people to come back to New Zealand. We're a small country compared to Indonesia. And all up, 150,000 people to come back to New Zealand or leave New Zealand. Now, that's a massive achievement. We did it without imperiling our health status, so to speak. And it just happens to be the circumstance that, you know, no one talks about Rudolph, the reindeer. It's Santa Claus they talk about. And in this circumstance of a medical crisis, it's the leader. And there's no, no use other politicians being envious or jealous or saying, why hasn't it washed off on me? That's life. But there's a campaign here, and we've got five weeks to get it really seriously focused as we go to the 19th of well, the, the early voting starts on the 5th of September. But we've got enough weeks to, put, to turn this around and put things in perspective. Let's talk about Brexit, which is, which is obviously a huge issue for the UK at the moment. Do you think this is an opportunity for the UK and New Zealand to reignite those special uh, relationships that we used to have before the United Kingdom joined the European Union? I'll give you an example. Um, I believe that trade with New Zealand massively decreased um, since uh, the United Kingdom joined the European Union. I think since 1999, the, U, the, uh, the UK's exports to, the, to New Zealand uh, has halved, for example. So is it time to reignite our relationship? Well, most definitely. And we should have started on the 24th of June, 2016. I mean, here we are, four year, more than four years on, and we're talking about you know, getting a free trade deal and getting underway. And you've got the Brexit, UK, United States deal you're working on. You've got Australia and others in the queue, but we are match fit, we're match ready to go. And I do not believe the UK is in the sense that they've not done any negotiations. All these years they've been part of the EU. We'd like to help out, we're not being arrogant here, but we seriously have put a lot of work internationally into the, um, the areas of free trade. And of course it's in our interest. Now, I think speed's of the essence, but here's the big picture. I mean, with the, the Brexit, you've got the Commonwealth capable of being revived. You've got economies before COVID-19 that were averaging 5% growth. 2.2 billion people we're talking about now, including India, the biggest uh, democracy in the world. That's what the uh, country of uh, the UK, but well, I think they should be seeing the big picture of, a Commonwealth Association as well, and as fast as possible. When the UK joined the EU back in 1973, perhaps betrayal is too far, but Many people say that New Zealanders and Australia were left behind by the British. Did, did you feel the same at the time? Did you feel that Britain was kind of walking away and realigning itself 
with other countries. Yeah, we did. And we still do in a way, because in the um, two world wars, the Second World War in particular, I mean, they were, we were the lifeline of food and, and supplies and things like that there. And we put together a seriously a highly productive agricultural base in this country where the corporate family, farming family in New Zealand, that's dad, mum and the kids, were able to match a landowner in the UK and four adults. We could outperform them because that's our skill we'd become. And all of a sudden, one day, uh, we were told, well, we're off to Europe and you guys are on your own. And do we feel dis disappointed about that? Yes, we do. I mean, in two world wars, we put it all on the line. We went to the Boer War when you, got, when you asked us to. You see what I mean? And there's no sin like ingratitude. I hope we can turn that around now as we go forward. Is Boris Johnson starting to change your mind on that? Well, I get on with Boris Johnson just fine. I did well, well before he became the Prime Minister, and I said to him, you're going to make it. Uh, when he resigned there, I sent him a note saying, look, I, didn't, I, I won't tell you what the analogy was, but I said, you're certainly going to make it. And he did, and I'm very pleased about that. And uh, I get on with Dominic Raab, but seriously, well, uh, 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 in, in the same circumstances. But I'm asking them to see a country that's really, when it comes to free trade agreements, we're totally match fit. We put a lot of work into it. And we're dealing with the European Union. We've been there for decades. And we are seeking a break because the values and the importance that we have in our part of the world in terms of the huge Pacific Basin and all those island nations, we can do a far better job to sustain the values of democracy and freedom and, dare I say it, uh, first world um, values, if we have a better economy, and we're asking the UK and other countries to help us. After all, the UK was there once, in the whole of the Pacific. Who's looking after, who's the guardian, the watchdog now? Well, it's us in Australia, and we just want them, and we want the UK to understand that better. I want to ask one more question, and this is again going back to the woke movement. Now, you mentioned uh, Captain Cook. Many people, would say that we should be ashamed of our past, especially the British, the evil colonialists. That's how they probably would characterize British history. In America, they talk about the evils of slavery. And I'm sure in New Zealand, Australia, and other places, um, people on the left would probably deride your history. Are you proud of your history? Are you proud of your um, past? And what would you say to people who say, actually, we should be ashamed and we should atone for the evils of our, our ancestors? My response to them is, well, you can't do that. You can't change history. You can't burn down monuments. You can't uh, bomb statues of Buddha or anywhere else like the Taliban and others have done and think you're going to improve history. What you must do is learn from it as you go forward. That's what your response to history should be. And let's not have these views that, for example, someone like Cook, who was one of the greatest explorers this country, the world has ever seen, is somehow to be condemned in this narrow, supercilious way, which is so unjustified. And when it comes to slavery, we had slavery in the Maori world here before any of the Europeans arrived. Well, we're just going to look at one group of people and not others. I'll make very clear to you where I stand, and that's this. When I look at all the options of the colonization of New Zealand, all the other options that were available to the world where we were concerned, I'm glad the British did it and not other, some other country. Because in the end, with all their failings, the British did have and do have some magnificent uh, um, uh, historic record where it comes to liberty, Wilberforce, freedom, uh, there are the belief in God and faith in the defense of the person's right to faith. These are magnificent values that are worth fighting for and worth standing up for. And that's the proportion and the a, categori a categorization of the, the importance of the British that I had. Now, I happen to be, of course, half Scottish when I say British, and we know things are not perfect between the English and the Scottish <laughs> either, but that's the reality. It's we can't change history, we can learn from it and learn we have. And just very, very quickly, you're optimistic for the election coming up? Yes, I am. You know, we uh, are out there to do what we've done over and over again to look at our media critics and all the pollsters and turn their polls for the umpteenth time into confetti. I started this party 27 years ago. They said we wouldn't last five minutes then. 
Well, it's been a long five minutes, hasn't it? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Winston Peters, for joining us. Thank you very much. Good luck.